21 million women in the US have some degree of hair loss. 40% of women experience hair loss before the age of 40. Hair loss often doesn't result from a single cause, but from a combination of factors. But women with hair loss are incredibly grateful when they're properly managed and counseled. In this video, I'm going to go through the history taking that goes into figuring out what might be the cause of a woman's hair loss. We'll also go through a common assessment that's done and potential treatment options. When it comes to taking a good history, it's important to actively listen with empathy. That's easier said than done, but when it's done right, you can start to glean lots of information from just a person's history. It's important to keep in mind that there's often more than one reason for the hair loss. I like to get a sense of how different organ systems might be affected, and that would include things like nutrition, infections, emotional states, different chemical agents, medications that the person might be on, and if there's any known autoimmune conditions at play. As far as taking a good hair loss history, we often start by asking, when did the hair loss first begin? I like to find out the exact location of the hair loss. Did they notice it maybe also on the eyebrows? Was it first in the front and then in the back, or has it been a diffuse type of hair loss? I like to get a sense of associated symptoms like burning, itching, pain. Also, it's good to find out which hair care products the patient uses. Some are safer for your hair than others. And we've done videos in the past where we've covered different types of hair care products and especially ones that you should avoid. And I also like to find out if there's any history of previous hair loss treatments. Some women come in with prior hair transplant work, so it's important to ask those questions to better plan for additional treatments. Now, when it comes to medical history, I always start with finding out about the family history. Is there hair loss in the family on either side for men and women? The genetics of hair loss are very complicated, and what was first thought to be much more simple, we now know it's much more complicated than that. And there are many genetic alleles responsible for hair loss. I also like to ask about past medical history. Is the patient also experiencing other medical problems that might be responsible for the hair loss? It's important to also ask about the diet. We know things like crash diets can lead to significant hair loss. And of course, stress. Stress is a major component of hair loss, usually temporary, but it can actually be permanent. So we always like to ask if there's a particularly stressful time in a person's life that they recently experienced that might have coincided with the hair loss. Now, as far as assessing for hair loss, it all starts with pattern recognition, and the skill comes in making sense of what is seen. Many patients come in asking if we're going to do a biopsy, and sometimes we do end up doing a biopsy, but oftentimes, just from the pattern of hair loss, you can really tell which specific type of hair loss condition you're dealing with. Now, the first is androgenic alopecia. This is the most common type of hair loss in men and women. In women, it presents as a preservation of the hairline itself, and usually behind the hairline is where you start to see thinning. And specifically at the part line, that's where it starts to show the most and it starts to get wider from there. There's a classification called the Ludwig classification that separates women's androgenic alopecia into one, two, and three for the Ludwig scale. Now, one is a thinner appearance to the part line, but it's not super prominent. As you get closer to three, you have a much wider appearance of loss in that central portion of the scalp. Now, the next subtype of hair loss in women is telogen effluvium. This comes in two variants. You can have an acute type of telogen effluvium where you have, say, like a viral infection and all of a sudden you start to experience significant loss. Or you could have a chronic telogen effluvium where there's a gradual reduction of hair. And this can present in a more diffuse pattern where even the back of the head underneath the crown, the occipital portion, can experience some loss. The next type that I wanted to bring up is cicotricial alopecia. 
this is a scarring type of alopecia. And with this type of loss, you usually see these unusual patterns of hair loss. And so anytime something doesn't fall into sort of the textbook type of loss, in these other categories, I start to think of scarring type of alopecias. And you can have a scarring alopecia that's quite active, or you can have an old scarring alopecia where essentially the process has burnt out and now there's no active inflammation. And when we're thinking about transplant surgery, we never wanna operate when there's active inflammation and active scarring, but it's okay to operate on a patient who has a history of scarring, assuming that the underlying condition is more or less under control and there isn't active inflammation. And usually we can tell with a biopsy. The next condition to bring up is alopecia areata, and that's the condition that I have. This is an auto immune type of hair loss where you get patches of hair loss usually these are circular areas sometimes they can start to fuse together and get more diffuse if you have a significant portion of your scalp that's experienced hair loss in the form of alopecia areata that's considered alopecia areata totalis if in fact the hair loss is more diffuse all over the body like i had then that is alopecia areata universalis and when you look with a microscope, you can see these exclamation point hairs. This is a textbook type of appearance to an alopecia areata scenario. And with alopecia areata, the body is attacking its own hair follicles. And oftentimes, once you get that inflammation and that autoimmunity under control, the hair follicles start to respond and can grow once again. Nowadays, we have JAK inhibitors that help with this process. And now I wanted to mention frontal fibrosing alopecia. This is a condition where the hairline actually recedes, right? Typically with women's hair loss, the hairline itself doesn't change very much. With men's hair loss, we think of that kind of recession and the hairline getting higher. But with women, we don't see that very often. So when it comes up, it's because of this type of condition, frontal fibrosing alopecia. And oftentimes associated with this, you can get some significant eyebrow thinning. And this is the type of scenario where we have to be careful when we're considering eyebrow hair transplants, because if you transplant into this type of condition of active inflammation, again, your grafts will not survive. There are some people that think that sunscreen might be contributing to the higher incidence of frontal fibrosing alopecia. There's still additional research that needs to happen before we can determine if specifically it has to do with sunscreen. It's probably not so straightforward, but there might be a substance in our sunscreens that might be leading to an increased rate of this frontal fibrosing alopecia. And next we have traction alopecia. Traction alopecia stems from wearing your hair in too tight of a hairstyle. So usually kind of that tight ponytail look that will stretch on the hair follicles, again causing some root irritation. As the root of the hair gets more irritated, eventually it might stop growing and it might scar down. So that's where we start to see this type of loss, especially happening at the hairline where the hair was pulled the tightest and the way to reverse that is to simply change your hairstyle and that will oftentimes help now continuing with the assessment of one's hair beyond the basic patterns that we usually see we need to look at the quality and the quantity of the hair that's still there we also want to assess the condition of the scalp itself the condition of one's skin and the condition of one's nails because for example alopecia areata often leads to pitted nail beds so it's good to get a sense of that when you're considering alopecia areata as a possible diagnosis some people might also use trichoscopy or dermoscopy which looks at the microscopic scale to assess the hair and specifically looking at different types of patterns i don't find this necessarily necessarily to be the most helpful in determining the next steps for a patient's hair loss, but this might give you additional information in the right clinical scenario. And of course, we want to document the condition of the hair with photography. And we usually do global photography where we just take a normal picture of someone's hair. 
There are also these standardized specialized systems that are used specifically in research to try to standardize how you're imaging the, the hair. Because remember, lots of things can affect how the hair is imaged. That could be the lighting in the room, it could be the settings on your camera, it could be the specific angle. Also, if there's product in the hair, it'll look different. If you style your hair in a certain way that's different from the after image, it will also change its appearance. And then of course, there's different lengths of hair. And of course, the color of one's hair will also play a role. Now, when it comes to hair tests, I prefer a pull test. This is a pretty simple method to just see if there's active hair loss. Basically, the test is positive if you grab gently about 60 hairs and over five hairs get pulled out as you're gently grabbing the hair, then we call this a positive pull test. And this means that there's a lot of active loss happening. Sometimes we consider a biopsy. A biopsy of the hair and scalp is done with a four millimeter punch. This punch technique goes through all the layers of the skin to better tell under the microscope if there's active inflammation going on. And this type of test, I'll usually do the actual punching and then suture up the hole that's left behind. And then I'll send that portion of the scalp to a dermatopathologist who will assess it under the microscope to figure out if there is active inflammation and what might be the actual cause of the person's hair loss. Other tests that exist, but tests that I don't typically use, are the daily count, hair breakage, densitometry, the wash test, and trichograms. There's also tests such as allergy testing, looking at things like gluten sensitivity, whether someone has sensitivity to dairy products, various sunscreens or components of sunscreens. Also, hair product ingredients can be used during a patch test. And then there are lab studies that we'll sometimes get to try to further determine if there's an underlying cause of the hair loss. And these can include looking at iron levels, ferritin levels, vitamin D levels, thyroid panel, and various hormones such as estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and prolactin. Now let's focus on various treatments that exist for women's hair loss. First, we have minoxidil, and this is available as a 2% or 5% foam or solution, as well as an oral tablet. The oral tablet for women will usually prescribe at a 1.25 milligram per day dose. The oral form of minoxidil is not FDA approved. It was not as fully studied as the topical minoxidil, but we do know through more recent studies that oral minoxidil is generally more effective and more potent than the topical formulation. Now, it might also lead to a higher risk of side effects, but it's overall extremely well tolerated. And we have oral minoxidil available on feelconfident.com, so make sure to learn more about it and check it out. We have dedicated videos about minoxidil. But just briefly, keep in mind that the mechanism of how minoxidil is working to improve your hair is generally by increasing the antigen phase of the hair growth cycle. Keep in mind that minoxidil is increasing the hair diameter more than it's increasing the number of hairs. 15% of patients will experience shedding initially when they first start minoxidil. After about three to four weeks, that initial shed should resolve. And the most common side effect of specifically topical minoxidil is contact dermatitis. And this is because of the polyethylene glycol that's used in the solution. And usually propylene glycol is absent in the foam preparation. So that can be used in place of the solution. And then of course, when you take it as a pill, you completely bypass any contact dermatitis. One of the other side effects of minoxidil is hirsutism or increased hair growth in areas other than the scalp. So the second most common place where you might see increased hair is along the sideburn area and the lateral cheek. So some women decide to wax those areas or get laser hair removal if they're bothered by that increased hair appearance. The next potential treatment for women, specifically for postmenopausal women, is finasteride. Finasteride is given at a one milligram per day dosage, and its mechanism is that it's a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. So it's decreasing serum and scalp levels 
of DHT. And DHT is what's causing miniaturization of your hair, both for male pattern hair loss and for female pattern hair loss. Usually with finasteride, there are signs of efficacy at three months and you can fully assess the effects at closer to one year. The most common side effects similar to men are also sexual side effects, with reduced libido being one of the most common forms of it. And typically these types of symptoms will reverse once you get off of the medication. But remember, finasteride is only available for postmenopausal women because it can cause some birth defects in a male fetus. Now another more common type of hair loss treatment for women is spironolactone. Spironolactone is an aldosterone antagonist, so it again reduces some of the hormones that might be responsible for the miniaturization of hair. And it also happens to be used as a diuretic in some patients, and it's used in young women to help control acne. Side effects of this medication can include hypotension or low blood pressure and potentially electrolyte disturbances. So you need to be monitored properly when you're taking this medication. It's usually started at a low dose like 25 milligrams once a day or twice a day and then that dose can be increased up to say 100 milligrams once or twice a day depending on how you're doing on the medication and depending on whether you're you're seeing efficacy of the medication at lower doses. Another possible treatment type is vitamins. Daily vitamins like B12, like Viviscal, Nutrafol. These are different types of vitamins that can be used to help improve the overall state of your hair. The key ingredient in these vitamins is usually biotin. What I usually tell patients is that the degree of improvement that you would see from these vitamins is rather small, so I wouldn't use it as a primary type of medical therapy for your hair loss, but it might be a fine adjunct to your routine. Another potential treatment for hair loss is low-level laser light therapy, and we have a dedicated video specifically about this. But just to run through it quickly, this is going to increase your blood flow throughout the scalp. But what we still don't know is the optimal frequency, the power, the diode count, and the duration of use that would optimize your results. Usually these devices are applied for about 15 minutes at a time and they're applied about three to six times a week. When we have situations where active inflammation is present or you're really losing your hair and shedding extremely fast, we sometimes consider steroids and that could be injectable steroids like Kenalog or it could be a topical steroid. Even for scarring conditions, a topical steroid can sometimes help. But of course with steroids you have to be very careful because over time there's systemic absorption and that can have various ill effects on different organ systems. Then you have an option such as PRP or platelet-rich plasma. Platelets release growth factors like VEGF for example and these growth factors can help stimulate hair to grow better. In this process you get a routine blood draw then that blood is processed and you concentrate the platelets in a special machine called a centrifuge then you take those platelets and you inject it back into the scalp. There's a less invasive way to administer those platelets and that's with the jet peel system and usually what we do with PRP is we will treat one month apart for three treatments and then we'll start to space out every four to six months doing PRP to improve the state of your hair. But remember with all of these medical therapies you need to continue to administer the treatment or take the pill or use the topical solution in order to see improvement to your hair. Once you stop doing those things you will notice that there's going to be a reduction in the quality of your hair. So this is not a one-time treatment. Keep in mind also that fat injections can be helpful with certain types of hair loss. Fat has been found to be anti-inflammatory, anti-androgenic. It can be used to increase the scalp thickness and it can enhance blood supply via leptin. I'll sometimes use fat in the form of a fat transfer for dormant scarring alopecia to prepare the scalp prior to a hair transplant surgery. Now for other types of treatments, keep in mind that scalp micropigmentation is an option and this is when small all dots of ink are applied to your scalp and this is done in a very careful manner to make sure that those dots have a gradient to them and so that they look more realistic. It is two-dimensional 
but it can look quite good. And uh, we have a video that we did on scalp micropigmentation if you wanna learn more about that process. Then when it comes to more surgical options, there's a surgical hairline advancement, and that's done not so much for hair loss, but when women come in with a high hairline. And we have videos specifically on SHA, or surgical hairline advancement. It's also called forehead reduction surgery. So check that out if you're interested in that type of process, but keep in mind that if you're experiencing significant hair loss, then you wouldn't be a candidate for this type of surgery. Now let's talk about when is it safe to perform a hair transplant for women. First of all, we wanna make sure that the hair loss has significantly reduced or that there's no hair loss at all. And this is done with the medical therapies that we've already covered. If there's active hair loss, it's not a good time to do a hair transplant surgery. One scenario for a hair transplant is if the hairline is naturally high or if there's frontotemporal type of recession that has pretty much been there since early years. Then if it's stable, we can consider a hair transplant to reduce the height of the forehead and also to improve the contour of the hairline. A hair transplant can be used to correct scars, and we have a video devoted to just this, but basically if someone has, say, a facelift scar and they're looking to improve it, and if the surgeon doesn't feel that there could be much improvement with excising the scar and resuturing, then a hair transplant into that type of scar can be quite beneficial. When a patient has scarring alopecia or alopecia areata, we look for stability of one's hair for at least two years before considering a hair transplant into those areas. And as with all hair transplants, we need to make sure that there's a good donor area that we have enough of a source to pull grafts from. And like with all cosmetic surgery, we want to have realistic patient expectations. You might need more than one transplant to get to the look that you're going for. To see more hair transplant results in women, head to our gallery at cityfacialplastics.com. If you're a woman experiencing hair loss, keep in mind that there are many options for improving it. So don't get too upset. Seek out the help of a professional to help you understand what might be causing your hair loss and what options are available to improve it.